So Ken Levine, thank you for stopping by today for a break room interview. Um, I really wanted to get a chance to talk to you about uh, a lot of things, really. Um, Bioshock Infinite, obviously, but a lot of other stuff is going on in the industry. First of all, how are you today? I'm good. I'm, I'm actually really, it's a beautiful day here, and I used to live in San Francisco, so it's been a treat for me just to walk around today and, and be here. So I feel good. The game's coming out a week from today. Exciting times. You're on the, the media tour going from outlet to outlet. Yeah. And you've been this, overseas. This is the last day of the traveling part of it. So You've got to yeah. be exhausted. Munich, Paris, London. Uh, I've been in London three times on this, on this game. Oh, um, Lord. But um, it's, you know, look, it's fun to be able to finally talk about the game. You know, to talk to people like you who played it, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a treat because we worked on it for a long time, and we really try to keep a cone of silence around almost, you know, the really important parts. Like, a lot of people ask... Right, like, rightfully so. If people ask, like, oh, is there anything left of the game to show after all the videos you've shown? And I'm like, you, you have no idea. They don't know the half of it, yeah. right? Um, so I... I guess the first question I want to ask you is, is more of a general one, and, and, and that's, so, you're in this very unique position in, in the industry where you have a lot of respect among the gaming audience because you make things that they love, but you also have a lot of respect among the publishers, and, and you're still making, you know, what so-called AAA games, but you're making challenging ones, ones that don't necessarily fit the mold of what we usually expect from a AAA game. You're one of the few people who can actually say that about what you're doing right now. What do you think makes Ken Levine special in that respect? What, do you, what, it is that, what is it that allows you to continue to do that where so many others can't? Oh, it's really simple. I, I made a game and I sold over 5 million units. And, <laughs> and, and, and that, that's a question. I don't know how they gave me that opportunity, but once you sort of have financial success, it's not, a, it's not my charm or my good looks, you know, which are substantial. Um, it really is um, the company is willing, you know, and that's rational to some of you. know, you have, they want to make the investment. I think Take Two is unique in terms of that they are, they do really believe, and I'm. This is not just sort of PRBS. They really do believe in their talent because they really did not get. They did not get involved creatively at all. They never came in and said you should do this or you should do that, and that's very rare, especially a game of this scale. I think, and um, it really is a very personal vision from the company of what we wanted to do. And I think if you try to pitch it to somebody, like you know, like if you just they didn't know anything about Bioshock, you just try to say, these are you know we're doing a game that has all these themes, and it's this very personal story about these two characters. I think you'd have a lot of publishers being uncomfortable because it's not what they think traditionally is like. Oh, okay, well, you know, where is it? Where's Al Qaeda? You know, like it doesn't really fit into that model. Do you think that if you were making the original Bioshock, but making it now, do you think that the game would see the light of day? Do you think that, uh, no? no? I think it was, a, it was a product of luck in its time, that it was early enough in the console cycle. There was enough enthusiasm, and it was, it was a people too. There were individual people at publishers um, who, you know, like you know, Susan Lewis and, and Christoph Hartman and David Ismailer, these guys, they decided to believe in it and fund it. And I'm not sure, and Greg Obi, um, I'm not sure that would happen today just because of the nature of the industry. And you, you have to make these huge bets and it's so much easier to rely upon sort of known quantities. And Bioshock was a very unknown and strange quantity. Have you ever considered, I mean, now that it's so hard to make a challenging game like that in that space, have you ever considered just saying, hey, maybe it's time to go go indie. You know, somebody like Tim Schafer has been able to make a, a success out of this. Have you ever thought, maybe I can just get a small team and go and do something that, uh, that I, it can really be, uh, you know, a major product of my imagination without huge marketing concerns? Yeah, I, I mean, it is, there is a lot of time that gets drawn when you have a game on this scale. I mean, to be honest, there's a lot of time that you have to work to make sure that it and I'm not talking, the game itself, like you played it, it's not a game that makes a lot of compromises in terms of its vision. It, it's, you know, we didn't, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of sort of, you know, making sure it's okay, this game's gonna be okay with everybody. It really is sort of, a, uh, we did what we wanted to do and we showed the story that we, that we thought, we try to honor this story all the time where we were going with it rather than thinking about is this gonna offend people or is this gonna, you know, um, how is this going to impact people? But there is, on top of that, you have a, a game with a fairly large budget, so you spend a fair amount of time just 
getting the word out. You know, the amount of press you have to do. Um, I think even people in the gaming industry don't have a hard time understand. Like where Bioshock Infinite might seem oversaturated to people who follow the hardcore gaming space, compared to you know, your average movie, the amount of people you reach, like we, it's 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 tiny. You know, a Transformers movie comes out and it's you know it is everywhere and. So you really have to make sure you're sort of elevating the amount of awareness as much as you can, because otherwise there are no more of these kind of games. These games are both, you know, they're expensive to make, and I really believe in them. And whether it's me making them or somebody else, like I love the fact that there was a, um, there's another Thief game. I love the fact that there's another, um, you know, that, that, that Dishonor was so great and was so well received. And I think it would have been tougher if there wasn't an example of financial success in this type of game. Um, and so that makes me really happy. Even if I never make another game like this, that'll be something that makes me very happy as a gamer, because I want to play these kind of games. We well, mentioned uh, Bioshock Infinite not, not being compromised in terms of the, the vision that you had for it. Let's, let's talk about some of the things that you don't compromise. Uh, the original Bioshock um, had a lot of things to say about objectivism, for instance, but it strikes me that maybe that's a, a less combustible target than something like the targets in Bioshock Infinite, which which go a lot more, which go a lot deeper. I would say, you know, you're, you're looking at nationalism and you're looking at organized religion. Um, do you worry that at some point, say, Fox News is going to pick up on this and say, "Hey, Bioshock Infinite or, or Ken Levine are anti-America. They're they're anti-religion." There's definitely, you know, I've already had, you know, sort of. There's some very scary places on the internet, you know, sometimes. But also there's people with, I think, like I've read some really interesting articles in, in <coughs> religious websites. Like, you know, not, not like, like scary, evil religious websites, but actually very thoughtful and, and smart religious websites. And I, one guy said it's just the fact that a game is out there that talks about religion. And I thought that was a very, is a, is a good thing. You know, that, 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 that brings religion to the discussion. Um, and you know, I've been very clear about the fact that I'm not a religious person, that, I, that I'm not a believer, and I, and I really struggled to make sure that when I wrote the character of Comstock, I had to understand what made him appealing and what made him tick to people, because I, I understood that with Andrew Ryan just sort of because of what, my background. Um, and as dark a character as Andrew Ryan was, I also understood what made him a great man. He was a great man in many ways, but he was also a very broken man in a lot of ways. And I wanted Comstock to sort of have have some of that, but the the um, you can't you can't work from fear, Kevin. You know you have to you have to work from doing. You have to follow the story. It's not, the story is your boss, and if you worry about that stuff, and trust me, there are people around me who love me who worry about it. Um, but. You got to follow the story, or why? Why are we doing this? Well, you did have some some team members um, that actually spoke out about uh, some of the subject matter in the game. How did that? How did that come about? And how did that conversation go? It, this is a convers. This is a conversation that's been very misunderstood in, in some interviews. So I want to be very clear of sort of the things that happened. So we had a couple of members of the team who are very very religious and um, see the world in a way that is. You know, I think I think somebody who is an extremely attached to organized religion has a particular has a worldview that's somewhat different from some, someone who's not doesn't have any sort of sense of organized religion. And so there was a part of the game at the end, which now you're familiar with, the very end, which they were really upset by, and they viewed it as an attack on their belief system. And so we sat down, and he actually wrote his resignation letter after playing. They put the controller down and wrote a resignation letter. And before he went out the door, I said, look, can I just sit down and chat with you? I just want to hear your thoughts. Because, um, you know, as a writer, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, this may sound cynical, but I'm always trying to find opportunities to learn more and, and understand perspectives, because that makes you a better writer. And even if you, I, so I hoped I could talk to him sort of out of leaving, but at the very least I would understand his worldview better. So we started talking about it, and it's kind of hard to go into a ton of details without spoiling stuff, but it, it made me realize there were a couple characters in the game, particularly Comstock and Lady Comstock, especially Lady Comstock, that were underwritten, that didn't have, um, in the way that Ryan was presented, in a way that you could really understand why people were drawn to him, 
I didn't achieve that. I hadn't achieved that, I don't think, with Comstock yet. And that's why I was struggling to write him. I needed to understand that part of him. And this conversation really opened my eyes to the opportunity of a character like Lady Comstock. And again, I don't want to do any spoilers. But it came out of a, a really painful but honest conversation of, and a very sort of a... Um, it was a unique conversation for me because to talk about faith on that level between a person of not, without faith and a person with faith and trying to find how that meshed and to tell a story that was both not shying away from anything but also understanding of sort of the whole spectrum, trying to understand the larger spectrum was really one of my... It was a very important moment for me and as, as a writer. It's a very fulfilling moment for me because to get that kind of honesty out of somebody and a topic they're so sensitive about was, was I thought, very compelling. Do you think that um, success for Bioshock Infinite might, in turn, open up success for other games that are that would like very much to explore these kinds of concepts, but are limited by sort of the way big publishers work and the, the fewer chances that they're willing to take on on subjects like this? It's unclear to me whether the fact that games, other games don't take on some of these subjects, and again, I think take on is, I'm not implying take on is that we are here to challenge these notions, you know, like we're here to explore these notions. And I think that um, any notion that people are afraid to have explored is a notion that shows a lack of confidence, you know, in, in people's, you know, s systems of belief. And I think that the systems that are most, you know, like if you look at, you know, for instance, the most extreme systems, the most sort of despotic systems are the ones also most sensitive to any questioning or any criticisms. I think it's a sign of strength of, of a belief system if it's open to a conversation about it. So that said, I think that is it, is it, is it the publishers or is it the developers that are sort of shying away? I don't actually know because I haven't been to the other publishers. I know Take-Two is a particularly Art, artist-driven company in terms of they put a lot of faith in the Housers and a lot of faith in me um, and a lot of faith in, the, in Sid Meier and those guys to so just go do your thing and we'll publish it and we'll, 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 do our, we'll do our best to make it successful but you just got to do your thing. Do you think there's a, a divide between the big publisher and the indie in terms of the subjects that they tackle and, and explore in their games? Well, I mean, so I have, that has been my experience because obviously, you know, we've sort of gone into topics that seem very non-commercial, you know, um, and I'm always surprised. I mean, I was as surprised as anybody at the success of Bioshock 1. Completely surprised me because I, I thought it was like, it was our weird little baby that we love, but everybody else would sort of look at it as like, bleh, you know, like this weird little thing, but we, we, lo we loved it to death. Um, and same with Infinite, like, you know, Will it be successful? I, I don't know. You know, like that's that's up to the gamers to decide. Um, but um, you know, as a gamer, it's not something that you would you would normally think. But then, if you look at the indie space, you have you know games like Journey, say, or games like um, um, you know um, Kentucky Route Kentucky Route Zero, uh, like that are really like coming from left field in terms of what you'd expect a commercially successful game to be. They don't have to sort of hit the numbers that because their costs are much lower that a Bioshock Infinite has to hit to be successful, and so they can sort of the experimentation there is less risky to some degree because you don't have that sort of you don't have that sort of big number you know to to make back. Um, so I think that's what's great about the indie space is it allows sort of this kind of experimentation and this kind of risk. But I think honestly, mainstream games. Hopefully, if, I mean, if we're successful, hopefully it will demonstrate that mainstream big budget games can start you know, spreading their wings a little bit in terms of the topics they take on. They are pretty traditional you know, in terms of their approaches. And that's not a crit criticism of them because I think it takes all kinds of games. Um, but right now you don't see a lot of that kind of risk in the large budget space. And actually, not too long ago, Jonathan Blow actually tweeted something that had people talking a little bit, which is, uh, you know, why is the media giving attention to Tomb Whatever instead of uh, this, this smaller indie game? And I wonder, you know, is it possible that he could have said Bio Whatever in that same breath? And do you think that uh, you're, you're bridging some of that gap, or do you think that could be actually 
you know, fair criticism of, of a game like Bioshock Infinite? Well, I don't think it's criticism of, I mean, so there's two, there's a bunch of questions there. I mean, it's, that's really more of a question for the media, like he's saying, why aren't you covering this rather than that? So right. like, I don't control what the media covers. I think that I've been on the other side of the equation, right? So I've, I've worked for many years on games that nobody really paid attention to. So I get that. And I think that we worked hard to make sure that we, we're trying to do the games we want to do without compromising. And I think that just because a game is smaller budget doesn't necessarily mean it's better or worse than, you know, I think there's some sense in the indie space that big budget titles are automatically just evil and bad. Right. And it, in the same way, I think there are cynical small games and there are cynical large games, you know? And there are smart small games and smart large games and dumb small games and dumb large games. And dumb doesn't necessarily even mean a bad thing. Like, I, you know, I'll, I like, you know, you know, smashing things and blowing things up in games and uh, as much as the next guy. Um, I'm not a, I'm not, I, tr I really try, I don't even have to try, I'm just not a gaming snob at all. I believe it takes all kinds and I think there are people out there who sort of have this feeling that games should be X or games should be Y and this kind of game is okay and that kind of game is not okay. And I actually had a discussion on a panel, I won't say who it was with, where they voiced the opinion that there should be certain topics that can be covered in games and there should be a group that decides, and she was a game developer, what, what kind of games are okay and what kind of games aren't okay. And to me, that was really like, whoa, like that's not where I want to see the universe going. Um, and I think probably because she felt very comfortable that her types of games would be in the okay list. And you know, at the end of the day, Who's to decide what's, you know, who's to decide what's good and bad? What, well, every individual decides what's good and bad. I love, there's a million indie games that I love, and I'm, you know, I'm like the biggest Kickstarter. I think I've supported like 53 or 54 Kickstarter titles. You know, I really love that space. But I also love the big budget space. I think it takes all kinds of games, and there's innovation happening everywhere. Um, and sometimes there's no innovation. You know what? That's okay. I like games that don't innovate at all because they're fun. Um, it just, not every game has to be a political statement or a work of art. So would you say that, for example, when you look at games like Dear Esther or Proteus or Journey and things like that, are you firmly in the camp that says, hey, this is a game and we don't need to come up with new words to describe this kind of experience? I think what they're all struggling with is that games are sort of have this weird tension that they're sort of like musical theater, right? You have this one thing happening, this play, and then all of a sudden, and it's like you're following, and it's very relatively naturalistic, you know, and then everybody starts going, do, 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 do. And, um, oh, that's going to be a gif, I know it. That's going to be a gif, like me doing that. Um, um, the, um, and I think it's weird, right? It is a little weird that you have this sort of mix of action and, and sort of narrative happening. And in Bioshock, we really try to make the seams of those as, as sort of... Um, invisible as possible between the two, where a lot of games you sort of do story, then action, and cutscene, story, then action, cutscene, story, then action. I think that what those games are saying is like, do you actually need the sort of skill-based component of it? And Walking Dead did sort of a similar thing. You know, they sort of really de-emphasize the skill-based component. As a gamer, I tend to like skill components of games. That's what, it, to me, that's, that's, I enjoy that. Definitions, they get a little more uncomfortable. Are they a game? I mean, what is a game? Does it, does it matter? You know, like their, their experiences, either interactive experiences that you enjoy. Maybe that's the definition of games, right? Like, maybe they don't require any skill. Maybe that's okay. Maybe that's, well, that's not, maybe that's okay. That is okay, because obviously people are enjoying those games. And I, you know, and sometimes I wonder like, oh, would I ever want to do something that really doesn't have a skill component that is just entirely narrative based, but it's interactive? Maybe, you know? Um, I think that experimentation is very valuable. So let's talk about, well, this morning I read an interesting piece by Jim Sterling on Destructoid about uh, the role of women in games. And uh, Tomb Raider's obviously been coming up a lot regarding how Lara Croft comes across and, and so on and so forth. But one of the things he mentioned in his story was, you know, hey, Elizabeth is relegated to the back of the Bioshock game. Box. Um, and there's obviously been a lot of discussion about uh, the Bioshock Infinite box art already. Um, 
what are, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, what, let's start with the marketing of your title and, and, and the box in general. How much of that is really about reaching the widest audience that you can? There are two things that exist. There's a game and there's, in the same way that Oreo cookies have nothing to do with what's on, like, what is the package of an Oreo cookie, right? It is a, a representation of something that's trying to catch your eye and appeal to you. Does it taste like an Oreo cookie? No. Does it feel like an Oreo cookie? Can you eat it? No. Does it have any nutritional value? No. Well, well, I, I, it would be great if Oreo new cookies had a lot more nutritional value because I, like I do like an Oreo. And the discussion about the box of the game, I mean, now that you've played the game through, my hope is you, that discussion sort of looks to you the way it does to me, which is like, it's one's fish and one's fowl. Um, and Bioshock Infinite, for whatever reason, has been a game that almost everything we do draws some kind of controversy. Like the fact that we have a particular illustration on the cover, the fact that Elizabeth is quote relegated to the back of the box. Very simple how you choose a box in gaming. It has nothing to do with how we make the games. We did a whole bunch of concepts, right? We showed them to thousands of people and we got their reaction because that is an honest, and I'm not just talking about, I'm not talking about hardcore gamers or, or jocks or anything, I'm talking to a wide range of people. And you say, and you see their reaction. And the goal is, and this is not, you know, this is not something to take lightly. The goal is something is like, when you walk by it on the shelf, is, some, is that person gonna go and pick up the box? And you can intellectualize that process a great deal. Think, well, well, what if this, what if that? But when you actually put it in front of people, you know, what is their, what is their reaction? And I understand why people are bothered by this because for some reason, Bioshock in particular is something they sort of put this particular value on. But what's Jim Sterling gonna say to me when the game, if the game doesn't sell? Is he gonna say, well, you really, you really fought the good fight with the box and then there's no more games like this. I think that is, I have a responsibility to the people, the company I work for, to the people I employ, to give them the best shot of having their work recognized and rewarded. And you know what, if I'm gonna get criticized because I chose a box cover, those people don't have the same responsibility that I do. I also feel I have a responsibility to, I love these kind of games, and this is not, I don't, I, the responsibility here is more of me as a gamer, I want more of these kind of games. And I think that we did everything we could for years to make these kind of games unsellable. You know, I went back to the System Shock 1 box cover and I look at that thing and I'm like, and as a gamer, I remember I had played Ultima Underworld and I loved, loved it. And I saw System Shock, I'm like, looking glass. I remember Ultima Underworld and I looked at that box and if you, if, if you could in this video, like find an image of the box and show it to people. And I and look at the front and look at the back and I was like, what the hell is this? And I put it back on the shelf. Now, obviously, there couldn't be a game that's more appealing to me in the universe than System Shock 1 because I went on to make the sequel and it's the philosophies in that game drove my entire career. But I put that damn thing back on the shelf because I had no idea what it was saying. And only later on when it was like in a collection, a bundle with like the CD version, like did I actually pick it up and just try it begrudgingly. And I was, I'm, I, I like immediately fell in love with the game. So, look, I think it's very, I, I get it. I get why people get critical. But if I did, we did all this work and I, I asked my team to work for all these years and I didn't give them the best shot of being rewarded for that. And I didn't give the game the best shot for being, for people getting past that initial hump of, it's not everybody's a hardcore gamer of what is this thing? You pick up the front, yeah, Elizabeth's not on the front. You flip it over, she's on the back. Sorry. Um, you know, like, if that's, if, that's their, if that's what it takes to make the game successful and to continue to employ people and to have more of these games, I'll take that hit happily. Um, but, you know, look, we did what we could to, to make the gamers happy. You know, we had a flip, you know, we, you, there's a, you can flip the cover over and we had the gamers vote on it. And it betrays to me a certain cynicism about what, it, I actually had a talk with Jim recently and we talked about a certain situation. I said, what would you do if you were in my shoes? And, and we're talking about a different topic. 
and something he was he was upset about. And I think and he said, I wouldn't do actually. I can't think of a thing I would do differently. And because I took him through my actual problem set, and it is it is hard work. It's not like the gaming industry is like rocketing forward in terms of its success lately. You know, and I think there is a danger of loving the baby so much that you smother it. And um, you know, look what happened to flight simulators. You know, that they were loved so much. Remember Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe and X-Wing and, and Wing Commander, how popular they were? And then, well, no, it has to be this, it has to be that, it has to be this, it has to be that, it has to be that. And then all of a sudden, no more fun flight simulators. They're gone because no, there's no market for them anymore. Um, and I don't, I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen to these games. I want them to be successful. I want them to be ambitious. I want them to be taking on new challenges. And if I personally have to go out and get a lot of crap, from people about a box cover, I'll do it. You know, I'll happily do it. And, but I'll also love the fans, so I'm gonna to try to give them what they want by giving them that reverse box flap. You can go to our website and download like all these alternate box covers if you want. I think it's, it really is, it betrays sort of a small view of the world to continue to beat on these topics because we can kill the industry with cynicism. If it's a game, I understand. If it's a game that's selling out, but a box cover, well, let's let's talk about the other part of that, which is the the role that women take take in games. Yeah. And uh, you know, obviously Elizabeth is there in, in Bioshock Infinite. But do you think that you could have made a game? So, for example, the the developers of Remember Me have come out and said, you know, we had problems shopping our game to publishers because it has a female protagonist. Nobody wanted to take on a game that had a female protagonist. And do you think that? Um, you know, let's say Bioshock Infinite, your vision for that could have potentially had a female lead character. Is that something that you would have worried about? Do you think that uh, you would have been able to publish uh, Bioshock Infinite in, oh, in yeah. that case? Well, I mean, working at Take Two, yes, absolutely. That wouldn't have been a problem. And I think to some degree, Bioshock does have a lead female, lead, lead female character. I mean, it really is her story. Um, well, it's both their stories, but she's the one, and I don't want to spoil anything, but, you know, I think it's safe to say, at very least, she shares the stage pretty equally, you know, with with, with Booker. Um, and I don't think I think you know, we, it's kind of hard to talk about this without spoiling anything. Understood. She really couldn't have been a female, you know. Not in this particular. Yeah, story. not in this particular story. Right. It, everything made sense the the way I was, and I always lead with the story. Like, why is Tenenbaum and Bioshock want a woman? Why is she not a man? She's a woman because as a writer, I thought about the character, I thought about the character, and she felt like a woman to me, you know? And Ryan felt like a man. Like, if Ryan was a woman, for instance, Andrew Ryan was a woman, like Ayn Rand was, Ayn Rand wasn't a wealthy industrialist. There's a whole level of explanation I would have had to gone through to explain why there would have been a female wealthy industrialist in that period, which is not, where Ryan could just be this iconic kind of guy. Oh, he's Howard Hughes, I get it. But with this philosophy. So I'm not a, I wanted to, I'm always a slave to the story. And to sort of separate out like, sort of a political belief system, like there should be more women in games. Like I, I get letters all the time, like you should have a positive X character in your game, a positive woman character, a character, positive gay character, a positive Jewish character. And listen, Bioshock 1, I'm a Jewish, I'm from a Jewish descent, is full of Jews who are sons of a bitches, you know, like Andrew Ryan, Steinman, um, Te um, Cohen, they're all Jews and they're all kind of horrible in their, you know, in their own way. Because I don't think that way. I don't think about a positive Jewish character. I think about interesting Jewish characters. I think about interesting gay characters. I think about interesting female characters. I think about who are these people? The notion of a positive, have you met a person who's a positive person strictly in your life? You know, there, are inter there are people and they have good days and they got bad days. And if a Pollyanna is kind of not an interesting representation of a character. So I want to I want to make interesting characters. I don't want to make men or women. I want to make characters. And um, so you have, you know, Lady Comstock makes sense as a woman in the game. Her role, her connection to Comstock came through a certain type of relationship. Daisy Fitzroy is a person who was put at the absolute bottom of that system. And that's the fact that she's African American, the fact that she's a woman, the fact that she you know, comes from a poor background. 
is exactly right for her because the person who's at the, who is driven to the very bottom of that system is the one who says, I've had enough. And so these decisions are all story-based. They're not from some outside agenda that I have to, to, um, to make games with the feature, heavily feature minorities or heavily feature men, women and characters. That's what we do. You know, Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite tend to feature a lot of minorities and a lot of, a lot of female characters as well. And it has nothing to do with an agenda. It has everything to do with a story. So in that respect then, would you ever craft a story, craft a game around an ideology or a philosophy that clashed entirely with, with your own? And does that make it more difficult to write? Well, obviously, I, I'm, there are aspects of Columbia that are you know, <laughs> completely different than my own philosophy. Oh, sure. you know, obviously, the racial bias in the society is so you know very far from my belief system let alone i don't even get into how they would view you know homosexual ca individual or i assume that sure we don't cover that in the game but i assume that wouldn't that's pretty underground i mean actually there's a couple of sort of very subtle notions of that and it's clearly underground in that world um you know on the beach you'll encounter a couple of there's a couple of places where booker sure. has a couple of interactions where it's clear that, that that lives in this world but in a very sort of over here way um, I don't know, Kevin. I, 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 I never. I, I deal with ideologies. You know, I don't believe in all the time. I mean, go back to System Shock Two. I mean, the many in Shodan were. You know, one was a collectivist. You know, ultimate collectivist society versus a fascistic, you know, um, monomaniacal individualist. And I do like to view myself as an individual, but Shodan took that to a whole new level, you know, and her children, to her chagrin, were the opposite of her, you know. And in Baoshock 1, you've got essentially a nihilist in the form of, 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 of um, Fontaine versus this true believer, this very rigid true believer. And in this game, you've got Daisy Fitzroy versus um, Comstock, who are about as different as they can be, but also you know, I don't want to squall too many things, but you know, they're also they have Perhaps they have rigidity. Similar in some ways. Yeah, yeah, they're similar in some ways. In the same way, I think Ryan and Comstock are similar in their rigidity, you know, and their belief system that that answers every question. I, I think so. I, I think pretty much almost I deal almost exclusively with systems I have some level of discomfort with, because to me that's much more interesting to try to find the the positives in that. Like when you go to Rapture. You look at a world and you see the potential there, right? It's an amazing place. It's not, it didn't start as a, as, an, as a nightmare. It started off as a place of incredible potential. And I wanted to show that, you know, I wanted to show the potential, but I also wanted to show what could happen. And same with Columbia, and what, there's no more, when you open the door, there was a moment where you open this door from this garden and you finally see the city laid out in front of you. And it's the most idyllic, beautiful thing you could possibly imagine. It's from a dream, you know, of, of what America, what people think of what America was back in the turn of the century. You know, minus the flying buildings and everything, but. It's a very sort of Norman Rockwell exactly. way to look at. Exactly, and the America. lighting and all that plays into it. And we want to show the appeal, why it, might be, why it might be nice to live there. It's such a simpler place, but underneath, other things are going on. So are you, are you tired of being so serious at this stage. I mean, you've, you've got Bioshock and you've got Bioshock Infinite. And this, this is heavy stuff that you're really getting into. I mean, is it time for, you know, I don't know, Freedom Force 3 or something? Yeah. Can, you, you know, can you finally, is it time to lighten up? I mean, it, do you get to the point where this stuff starts weighing on you and you really wish you could flex your creativity in, in more lighthearted ways? I actually think that some of the best comedy comes in, in drama, in drama. It's like, some of the moments I'm proudest of and happiest about in Bioshock Infinite are actually some of the funnier. I mean, there's actually, I mean, hopefully, it's, you came across as humor. There's a fair amount of like lighter moments and, you know, the Lutesses, and even though they play a very serious role, you know, that, 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 that couple of people sure. have some, they're, they're intended to be written in a very, you know, like they yeah. come when across. When they appear, the music gets all yeah. jaunty and, and it's, they have an interesting interaction between yeah. them. So. They're sort of out of joint with the world, you know, they're, yeah. by, by intention. And there's just some funny, you know, there's 
you know, there's a lot of characters that have a fair amount of humor. Booker, you know, there's some light moments in Booker and Elizabeth's relationship. Um, I think that Freedom Force is obviously, you know, an homage to something that's very close to my heart um, in the Silver Age of comics. Um, and was very light in a lot of ways. And everything was written for, for a gentle a gentle sort of nudge at the sort of goofiness of the period. But also, if not for that period of comic books, I'm, there is no Bioshock. Like, like the kind of narrative conceits, how he combined Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and guys of that elk, combined sort of this very goofy storytelling style, like with this re these really serious themes, you know? great character stuff like you know the the great the, the spider-man origin story is a i don't care what you say it was told in a goofy period style but it is a great story about a kid who learns that you know great power comes great responsibility look at the story of um of, of you know dr doom I and mean, you have all these goofy names and things attached to it but it's a story of a guy who had everything who he could not stand the fact that he was, you know, he was incredibly good looking and wealthy and brilliant and all these things. He was royalty. But Reed Richards was a little bit smarter than him. And that drove, he could not accept that. He destroyed himself because of that. Like these little tiny things. And you see it in your own life. I've seen people who are destroyed by the stupidest little thing or let things destroy them. And they're told, they're writ large, but they're, but they're you know, but they're, they're really so meaningful stories. And even Freedom Force, we try to have a story that resonated underneath all that goofiness and all that humor. I think that I would never be happy telling a story that I felt had nothing at all to say relevant to anything of the human condition. And as goofy as Freedom Force was, it, you know, we tried to have a little bit of that in the same way the Silver Age comics did. Um, but as a pure comedy, comedy is really tough. The hardest thing I've ever had to write in my career was writing my, the speech I did for PAX, because it was basically a, com, you know, a comedy routine with some, hopefully some resonance for people about, you know, I talked about growing up as a nerdy kid and all that, but jokes and timing and all that kind of stuff is very, very tough to write. The hardest thing to write is comedy, I think, in general. So, Bioshock seems to be at this stage right now where you could do almost anything that you wanted. I mean, there are certain themes that, that crop up and certain gameplay elements that sort of tie things together, but at this stage, it feels like you could do almost anything. You already have ideas going around in your head for new universes you can explore, new, new realities that, that, must be, you know, that must be examined. No, I have none, actually. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Like, I, I don't... I'm, I'm like a, I'm like a, you know, I put, a, a game puts a ring on it with me, you know, like I really focus on the thing I'm fo focused on, and then I let, you know, then you let it go, like, you know, the end of Bioshock 1, I thought I was done with Bioshock, you know, um, and it took six months to sort of realize what, what I could, do, what Rational could do in the Bioshock space, and still retain its the enthusiasm, you know, for, for what Bioshock was. The last thing we want to do is do a game that we feel we already know how to do it, you know? And if it was not a game that we knew how to do, in fact, you know, and its delays have been certainly, you know, very publicly, you know, discussed. And look, there are things we didn't know how to do that we had to figure out how to do. It happens. And if, if we could have done a game that, you know, delivered right on the money, right on the time, and taken two years, and it would have looked very much like Bioshock 1, and it would have felt very much like Bioshock 1, and it would have, to me, been not a good use of those two years. So, let's talk new consoles for a minute, because obviously we saw the, the PS4 announcements, and you know, I'm curious to know whether you're excited about the possibilities of what new console hardware can do, um, or if you feel like you know, you've sort of exhausted what you want to be doing, and it's not about the console anymore, but about the, the creative element instead. You know, are there things that you want to do that now you might be able to do that you could before? Well, I don't, have a, I don't have a thought for our next game, so it's kind of hard sure. to even think about that. I know that if you look at Bioshock 1, 
you look at Bioshock Infinite and realize that, you know, separate from the PC version, they're running on exactly the same hardware on the PS3 and the Xbox 360. And this is not just our company. I'm not saying Irrational is unique here. It's amazing what can happen, what knowledge can do, you know, programming knowledge and art knowledge can do over the course of a generation. The kind of experiences you have at the beginning of the generation and what you can do at the end. Um, it's kind of, it, I always think of it as one of the things that makes me proudest to be in the gaming industry because it's a power of engineering, you know, it's a power of good smart people. You know, Bioshock 1, you're a single guy in a corridor fighting a monster or two with views that don't go out very far, you know, and if you know anything about game engines and the Unreal Engine, that's exactly what you want to make. And we still pushed it at the time, we thought to its limits, you know, when we made that game. Like, it wasn't like we were like, oh, this is easy, you know, we worked really hard and we had to optimize and make all this decisions. And then we go on to make this game that has these huge vistas and floating buildings and tons of characters around you. And then to add on top of it, Elizabeth, who is a substantial drain on system resources. Um, she's always around, she's always pathfinding, she's always looking for stuff to do. And if you know anything about game engineering, you understand that these are very expensive things. They did it though, you know, in the same piece of hardware. It's incredible to me. And that's not just irrational. You see that all across the industry of, you know, look at, you know, going from Arkham, you know, Arkham Asylum to Arkham City, you know, all of a sudden they take the same sort of thing and they expand it out, you know, to a much larger canvas. Um, I think that um, I'd have to sit back and really think about the next generation, what it meant. Obviously more memory, more power is always a good thing. I love the fact that Sony's architecture is now much more aligned with the architecture of the other, the other, the PCs and, the, and, and pro, you know, I can't say about the Xbox, but I presume they're continuing in that direction. I, actually, they may, for all I know, they'll completely come out and surprise me. That will make life a lot better for gamers because you won't have that sort of diversification of resources in the same way that you had to do to sort of support the, different, different, the differences in the platforms. Um, in terms of not, I don't mean they're like, you know, move versus connect, I mean just specifically the hard, the architecture underneath. So that's, um, that's a positive, but I haven't really sat back and thought about the particular features or what I would do with the additional power, besides the obvious things like, you know, I'm a, I like detail and, you know, more power gives you more detail, but that's, that's obvious, so. Um, I think you start running then into, at some point, an issue of can you produce enough content to fill that detail, because Bioshock Infinite really strained our, we had to produce a lot of, we produce a lot of content to really get that level of detail. So then you go beyond the systems, like can we build an infrastructure internally to build enough content to support, you know, to fill out that space? Um, and that's gonna be another challenge. So who, who's work out there right now, what developer is, is producing the work that's most interesting? Who are you looking up to? When it, when it comes to, these are the games that I love playing and these are the developers that I, I, I love seeing what they do. I think there's little bits of, and like every game I sort of see little bits of things that really, both fill me with joy and fill me with envy, you know, like uh, like moments, like particularly, like, for instance, the, the base battles in Far Cry 3, I just thought really brought me back to a level of open-endedness that I haven't seen in a while. Um, I thought Red Dead, was amazing in the sense of how powerful, both Skyrim and Red Dead, of how powerful nature could be. You know, just being in nature and that sense of open space without, you know, like our games are very detailed and they're really low level, and that's what our games are about. They're these low level details. And those games are about, you know, look at this. I'm riding across the horse. I remember riding across in a plane in, in Red Dead and the sun was going down and all of a sudden it started to rain and like just this moment of feeling like I'm in the old west, you know, this is, this is incredible. And Skyrim, you know, the kind of like, you know, being on the top of a mountaintop as day turns to night and the snow starts coming down and it's, that's incredibly powerful. Um, I, you know, I like what I'm seeing in terms of, you know, how People are thinking about character. You know, I haven't had a chance to play Tomb Raider yet, but I know, you know, the team and Rihanna are, are really talented. And the fact that they're really sort of focusing on her evolution as a person is cool to me. And you're just seeing better writing in general. You know, the, the, the Walking Dead guys, um, the guys at Valve, the guys at, at Bioware. 
you see writers sort of coming into their craft and understanding the craft of these game writers, and that's interesting. Um, just in general, too, the the models of Kickstarter and the, what the kind of games that that Wolf War kind of games you thought would never get made again, you know. Uh, you know, XCOM was one of those rare games this year that I absolutely adored. Not not rare. I mean, it's not rare that I adore games, but it's rare that you could take a very old school concept and find a way to modernize it without while keeping the soul completely intact. And but then you have games, you know, you see on Kickstarter that are really feel like games that you never thought were going to get made again. You know, you know, I love seeing the um, I love seeing um, Claire Sabalone and those guys doing a, like a, a, a Icewind Dale style game. Never thought there'd be another game like that. And that's great. So, <clears throat> pardon me. No, I've got something in my throat. <clears throat> so are you envious at all that uh, you're not part of uh, working on Thief 4? Are you anxious to see what they're doing? Do you wish that you could be a fly on the wall and, and know what they're up to? Do oh, God, no, because I want to play it. You know, like, <laughs> I love, I mean, the fact that people are still working on characters that I worked on you know, in 1995, like, we never, th if somebody told me back then that, A, that people would still, people would be asked, you know, be excited about Garrett in 2013, 2014 on, let's see, the PS1, I guess, was out then, on the PS4, you know, like, that would be a brain, and it was not that Thief was on the PS1, but I'm trying to give a sense of this, you know, scale of time. Um, you know, you sort of would scratch your head and be like, you, okay, sure. Um, but we're getting to the point where franchises are 10 and 20 years old. And, and the fact that people are, can still find joy. Like, I just opened up my mailbox and Game Informer came out and there was Thief. And I, didn't, I wasn't even aware, really, of its... I wasn't really paying attention to its development. I'm like, oh, there's that guy. I remember that guy. Um, and that's, that's really flattering and thrilling. And, you know, and I certainly I was not the driving force in that game. That was a lot of other people. But to see that character that I sort of you know, developed um, at the beginning, came up with his backstory and his tone, and um, they wrote the first lines for, and there he is on the cover of a magazine 15, 20 years later, whatever it is. It was really cool. Um, but I don't want to, I don't want to, no, I wouldn't want to make a Thief game because. I don't know what I would do with it at this point in terms of making it different. And I certainly wouldn't want to go back and redo anything. And certainly, and I'm, I don't want to overemphasize my role on it. I was mostly character and story on that and initial systems design, but the real work comes at the end, you know? So I don't want to overemphasize what I actually did on it. Um, and um, you know, the, those last six, eight months of development are like, if you're not there, you're really not on the game in a, in a way that other, that that delivers, you know, that's really where the real decisions get made. Um, but I wouldn't want to work on it. I'd rather play it. So before we, we come to an end, I, I kind of want to circle back to, to Bioshock for just a minute, because I'm, I'm sort of curious, with the game coming out next week, is there, is there anything you, you worry about once people really get their hands on it? Are you worried that it will be misunderstood? Are you worried that people won't take to it the way you expect? Will they be offended? What are the... What are the things that you might you might worry about come next week? If I th anything, I think I'm surprisingly. It's not that I'm not concerned about, you know, will it get good reviews? Will it sell? I, I know we did our best, and I know we, we. It is the game we intended to make, and it is on, an honest expression without compromise. So if people love it or they hate it. Or they like it a little, or they, you know, they they buy it. They don't. All you can do is do your best and leave everything on the field, you know. And we left everything on the field. It is, it is our heart and soul in that thing. And certainly, to the point where, like, it's not a game I would want to. It's not an experience I would want to go through again because it was so all-consuming of me. You know, like I really put. Like, breaking down that story, you know, that was one of the proudest... I'm really proud of it, and I can't tell you whether people will like it or not, you know, especially the ending. It took us months and months and months of grueling work, of just, like, really... Days where you go home and you go, we're never going to figure it out. We know what we want to do, but we're never going to figure out how to actually do it. And there were days that I really wanted to cry. Like, I wake up in the morning, I wouldn't want to go to work, because it was so... Things that were so hard to figure out. 
And times like when you, Elizabeth would be walking into walls and literally for, you, for, for months and months and months she was just, where's Elizabeth? She disappeared, she fell to the ground, she walked through a wall. She's, <laughs> she's coming up to you and staring at you creepily. She's missing her marks. She's interacting with the wrong thing. It's like remember the shark and Jaws, right? You know, that, that, all those classic stories. She was our shark and Jaws. Absolutely central to what we were doing, but so complicated. She is one of the most complicated things I think ever made in, in a game in terms of, she's this giant pile of ideas and content. And there's a bunch of code and much of design that decides what she does and when she does it. That's very, that's very player, in many ways, very player driven, which is what makes it hard. If she was a cutscene, easy, you know? But we left everything on the field. And so that's all you can do. Um, they say you left everything on the field and then you sort of let it go and you see how people react. But I, there's nothing I could, there's nothing I would do, I couldn't really do much differently because I just, we gave everything to it. You say that 2K has been remarkably hands off through, through this entire process, but I mean, what if they would have come to you and said, hey, the PC version needs to be always online, or if they would have come to you and say, you know, this isn't working for us, we need to throw in a multiplayer component, or so on and so forth. Are those, are those compromises that you think you would have been willing to make, or is this a hypothesis that you're not comfortable with, or you know, what happens well, when unreasonable demands are made? I've had that. I mean, generally, like I've had, I worked on a game once, on Tri's Vengeance, where the publisher came in and they said, we need to, we want to sell, um, StarCraft had come out, right? So like, we want to sell games in Korea. Put a Korean character in your game. And I was like, A, I mean, knowing anything about different cultures, and I don't know anything about the Korean culture, really, I, I'm not presenting myself as an expert. I know throwing a character into it who looks, who has, you know, a different color skin, and different shaped eyes was not going to make the Korean audience care. There's, there are cultural things that are run very deep. I mean, when you go and watch, you know, Oh Boy, you know, it's, it is a product of Korean culture. And there's things about it that are very different from American culture. But it, it, it was enough, obviously there's enough that people could, I don't know if you've ever seen Old Boy, but it's something that people could tune into, you should see Old Boy. Um, okay. um, you know, and you watch some, sometimes you watch a foreign film and you're like, I have no idea what this is about because culture is so powerful. And, it was, and, it was, and I knew they were just, they just had no, they weren't thinking about it. They weren't thinking deeply about the problem. They were just generating work for us. And at that point, I wasn't, we weren't in a position, I can't remember whether we actually ended up doing it or not, but I know I can tell you probably weren't in a position to say no. Um, but in general, we haven't had a lot of unreasonable demands made on us um, as a developer. And at Take Two, we've been incredibly lucky. I think the only thing that they really demanded on Bioshock One was multiple endings, which I did not want to do. Um, but that, but we didn't have any. I don't think there's been a single. There have been things like, "Hey, have you thought of this?" Um, where I either dismiss out of hand, think about, or and then dismiss or implement if I think it's a good idea because listen, lot, you get lots of good ideas from lots of places. I mean, there was a guy at 2K who worked with us on Bioshock 1, Greg Gobi, on the creative side who was incredibly, incredibly useful and a critical part of the team, you know, in terms of bringing new ideas to the table. It's all about your ideas. If your ideas are good, they have a place at the table. If they're not good, they don't. But thank God I worked at a company where Ideas were never sort of forced on us at all, ever. So if you if you if something really offends you in the game, don't blame 2K. <laughs> so I guess to to wrap up maybe. Um, so you said that you don't really have an idea for what you want to do next. Um, but do you have any in terms of a game at least? Do you have any idea of what Ken Levine is going to do next? You know what what do you do? now, out, just outside of games, if, is it time to take a break? Is it time to uh, brainstorm a new project? What, what, what happens next? Well, a little bit of all those things. I mean, I think I definitely need, and I talked about this in this Polygon interview I did, and I definitely talked about like, the need, the importance of sabbatical. Um, like the three weeks I spent at one point in my career, if, you know, if you're interested in this story, go. Re there's a Polygon article about this that goes in depth, and I want to bore everybody here with it again, where I talk about going to 
to Idaho for three weeks and sort of breaking out of my routine and reimagining my entire, sort of accidentally reimagining my entire life and realizing I needed to be back. I had been out of the creative space, moving, I need to be back in the creative space. And if I didn't take that trip, I would, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Now, if I had stayed on that treadmill, and I think I need to step off the treadmill again a little bit um, and spend a, go back and sort of think about the future because the future of gaming is an interesting space right now because who knows exactly where games are going and I want to make sure that we're doing something that is going to be relevant and meaningful three years, you know, whether it's a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, whatever it is, um, you don't want to end up doing something that is short short-sighted and won't have a won't have a meaning several years later well Ken thanks for for joining me thanks for coming in the game spot and uh, letting me sip tea in front of you while we while we talked but obviously you're looking forward to Bioshock coming out next week see what people think and I'm sure people out there are looking forward to it too so uh, thanks a lot for stopping by it was super awesome having thanks you. Kevin appreciate Absolutely. it